Greetings viewers and YouTube subscribers. My name is Fabian and today I'm going to be taking you through a mock-up of the Rock Solid Engines Revalve Intake and Warbro Carburetor Assembly or a diaphragm type carburetor which you can see here. Very similar to a chainsaw type carburetor. Component parts that you will need to complete this assembly if you purchase through Rock Solid Engines is the air horn that allows the filter to attach onto. You will obviously need the carburetor, you will need the thermal isolation spacer, which as described in a previous video is critical. You will need the reed valve kit. You will also need the Warbro type carburetor or diaphragm carburetor adapter. You will also need 75 millimeter long studs, shown here. Conveniently, these studs are the exact same studs that you pull out of the engine on the front engine mount. So if you are using a shift kit, you would pull these studs out of the engine and you would reuse these studs on the adapter. In my case, I've just simply screwed the studs straight into the adapter and used a Loctite 263. What you can also see in front of you are a pair of stud nuts. So they're effectively just a long nut um, and if you can't get stud nuts, you will use nylocks, but stud nuts make things a lot easier. You'll see a bunch of washers that I'm going to use as packers on the end of the studs to push the stud nut further out, thereby clearing the air horn so it's much easier to screw the assembly together, as you will see later. You will also need a bunch of these exhaust gaskets, which conveniently work on the intake. Now, these exhaust gaskets will fit, obviously, in between the intake port face and the face of the reed valve kit where the petals are that you can see here. The reason why these are being used is to prevent heat traveling into the aluminium of the reed valve intake. Even though you have a thermal isolation spacer here or thermal isolation block, what happens when the engine gets quite hot is the heat makes its way through the aluminium into the studs, down the studs, and from there it radiates heat into the carburetor. This only happens when the engine is particularly hot. Um, if you're, let's say, climbing in an alpine environment where you're at slow speed and the engine's under a lot of load, so there's not a lot of airflow over the engine. But what will happen in such a situation, if you don't have thermal isolation between the intake port face and the reed valve, the heat will move through the aluminium, up through the studs, and then it'll push the heat into the carburetor and boil the fuel in the carburetor because these type of diaphragm carburetors only have a very small fuel reservoir. So even though you have this thermal isolation spacer here, that spacer cannot prevent the heat traveling up the studs. So we must prevent that and by doing so, we are using a set of exhaust gaskets. In my case, I'm using three to prevent excess heat moving between the port and the reed valve intake. And then the rest of the thermal isolation, or the bulk of it, happens through the thermal isolation spacer. So what we'll do now is a mock-up. But just before we do that, I'll give you a quick pointers on some other items you will need. Every setup is different, but in my case, I needed um, to go from the fuel tank down to the carburetor. I needed 220 millimeters of 5 millimeter internal diameter fuel tubing. I needed uh, 130 millimeters of length of 3 millimeter internal uh, fuel tubing. I needed 50 millimeters of 3 millimeter internal fuel tubing. For the system to work, you need to be able to get fuel from the fuel tap into the carburetor. Now, unfortunately, because the fuel nipple on the carburetor is quite small, you are not able to go directly from this type of fuel line, being 5mm internal, onto this type of nipple. So to do that, it has to be done in two parts. You've got to come from the fuel tap or the filter. So you'll have a line coming from the tank to your filter, from the filter through to this 100 or 220 millimeter length of fuel hose. You'll take the 50 millimeter fuel hose, you will stick it inside the 220 millimeter fuel line hose, and that enables you to go from a large diameter to a small diameter, and from that 
onto the fuel intake nipple. This 130mm length of fuel line hose will be used to get a crankcase pulse from the crankcase up into the carburetor. So in this case, if I rotate that over, you will see that it is okay, this particular part of the carburetor here will have the crankcase pulse line attached onto it. So this 130mm length of fuel line hose will attach onto this part and that will then go around to the block of the two-stroke engine so it can get a crankcase pulse and operate the diaphragm in there. You can operate these without a fuel line but they just do not work properly. You need to get a crankcase pulse so that's what that fuel line is there for. The other thing that you will need is a Loctite 222 or any generic type of thread lock but it must be low strength Loctite or low strength thread lock and you'll see how that works a little bit later on in the video so we'll get rid of that okay just quickly this normally attaches onto the revalve intake so that the NT carburetor can fit onto it but because we are converting this to a diaphragm type carburetor shown here you get rid of this item And in place of that item, you attach the adapter bracket or the adapter boss onto the reed valve intake. So now I'll bring this up and hopefully you can hopefully you can see how this all works without it going out of focus. So as described in a previous video, that's your reed valve intake with the reed valve pedals. That there is your adapter block, this part here. That is the back face, or the front face, whichever way you would like to look at it. So you can see these two M5 bolts, they attach this adapter block onto the reed valve intake. And then you take your 75mm studs that you pull out of the engine, which would normally serve the front part of the engine. You take them out of the engine and you screw them into the adapter block and you use Loctite 263 to screw them in there and that is high strength Loctite. Once that high strength Loctite is set it's in for good effectively. You really need heat to get them out. But you do not want to have these coming out because when you try to undo the stud nuts you do not want the studs coming out of the adapter block so you want these studs fixed in place. Just going on for that, the next part of the process, if you choose to use adapter spaces or, or exhaust spaces as thermal isolation, you will need to make the bolts 5 millimeters longer. Three of these adds up to 5 millimeters. Conventionally, without these in place, the bolt will be 30 millimeters long. In our case, because we are going to use exhaust gaskets as thermal isolation devices, we use bolts that are 35 millimeters long, as you can see here. They will screw, okay, bring this up, they will screw into this hole, they'll screw into that hole like so. You can see it there. It screws in, pokes out the other side. You can see them poking out there. The exhaust gaskets will sit on that point there and they will act as our thermal isolation. So now we'll start the assembly. I've just taken a dummy cylinder or a worn out cylinder and we'll attempt to do the assembly on this. Every port spacing is a little bit different or every stud spacing is a little bit different with the Chinese engines. Um, their quality control isn't very good. So I'm hoping that this all just screws together like the engine that is in my bike at the moment. So we take the three exhaust gaskets. We will put the 
bolts through as you can see there we will put the gaskets on there which are likely to be a little bit tight in the hole but I don't mind that there goes one as you can see Now we're screwing in the third one, I'm trying to get out of your way. It's kind of a little tricky trying to do this when I can't see what the camera view is. Okay, try and get it to focus. So now you can see the three exhaust gaskets. That we're using as thermal isolation spaces. And you can see the threads poking out there. That's why you need the extra five millimeters of length this unit now will screw straight onto the block. Oh, I should say straight onto the cylinder, my apologies. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. So, so you can see what's happening now with these reed valve intakes what you have to do unfortunately if you can see that there you have to, this third fin cooling fin that you can see you have to relieve part of that cooling fin you can see it there if there's another way I can show it I'll try maybe you can see it there that cooling fin, you have to relieve that cooling fin so that the reed valve intake can slide down and correctly sit on the intake port. So you can see that this here is sitting up. It's just something that you have to do. There's no way around it. But it only takes five minutes to do that. Okay. Okay, completed item. So you can see the get it to focus for you. You can see the exhaust gaskets in there. And that's acting as our thermal isolation. Really the only reason for that is just to try to stop heat coming through these studs. That's the only reason why they're there.
what I would normally do in this situation is I would put Permatex copper um, silicon or um, cop copper gasket maker, I guess you would call it. And I would smear that all over here. You can see that I've previously had this on my bike running. And there's the Permatex, which is that orange stuff that you can see there. But for the sake of the mock-up, we're not going to get involved in mess. The next part of the process is to install the thermal isolation block. So this thermal isolation block simply goes over the studs. So I put Permatex on there, I put Permatex on here, and I would slide it on like slide it on like so. Okay. There you can see the thermal isolation spacer in place. You can see the tunnel ram type effect that you're creating. You're creating all of this length that air is accumulating ahead of the reed valves. And once you start to get some airflow happening in there, the air has mass and it ends up, I wouldn't say supercharging the engine, that's the wrong word, but it does add a little bit of volumetric efficiency because of that air mass that's coming through there. When the reed valve pedals close, all the air builds up against it, you end up with a very slight increase in pressure. And then when the engine starts to open the reed valves again, it assists the air flowing through the reed valves. Or velocity stack, I guess that would be the more correct term. You're effectively creating a velocity stack with this system here, which is another benefit of the reed valve intake kit and Warbro or diaphragm type carburetor kit. Okay. Next part of the process is to simply install the Warbro carburetor. So in this case, it would be sitting on the engine like so. So you have the throttle arm. Okay. So here is your throttle arm. That's activating. So if you look on the back face, you see a throttle opening and closing. On this other face is the choke. So let's say we'll leave the choke open. You would then put Permatex on again, or a silicon type seal or high temperature type sealer. You would attach your diaphragm carburetor on like so. Just bear with me. Okay, so to stop the gasket breaking, I'm just simply using using this technique just to walk the gasket down. Simply using a socket to push the gasket down. Okay, so the gasket is now down. The Warbro carburetor or diaphragm type carburetor is on. Next part of the process is to install the air horn. Get it to focus for you again. So the air horn is this device here. This part of the air horn is where the air filter would sit. It actually sits in, sorry, in that orientation with the cable attachment or the throttle cable attachment here and this is where the air filter would sit okay. so we now have carburetor on and the air horn will go on and line up with the carburetor so now you have air horn, carburetor, thermal isolation spacer reed valve intake and diaphragm carburetor adapter and the exhaust washers or exhaust gaskets serving as a thermal isolation block. So here you can see the 
Venturi stack, or Velocity stack I should say. Forgive me, I'm trying to think ahead of myself. You can see the Velocity stack arrangement. So now you have to screw it all together. So inside you can see the, the studs protruding. And there's quite a bit of stud protruding there. So there's approximately 20 millimeters of stud protruding. In this case, these stud nuts, they're 16 millimeters long. So what we want to do is to try to get the stud nuts to poke out above the top of the air horn. So what we'll be doing is using spring washers, such as this. So in this case, if it was on the engine, we would close the choke so that nothing can fall into the engine. We would then start adding spring washers. One. Hey, this is what I was trying to achieve. You can see the stud nuts, they're poking out. That will not have any effect on the intake flow into the engine because you can see the intake is completely clear. The stud nuts are outside of the ball of the air horn or the internal part of the air horn. But what it does do, we, in this case I've used four spring washers and I've used one flat washer and that has enabled the stud nuts to poke out thereby thereby allowing me to get this up for you like so allowing me to get an open-ended spanner or a ring spanner in this case whatever you would call it in America we in Australia we call them ring spanners so to get it on there. Or that way. And do the thing up. Next part of the process is you have to plumb things up. So you would then take your 50 millimeter focus. You'll take your 50 millimeter technology fail, 50 millimeter piece of fuel line. You will then take your 220 millimeter piece of fuel line. You would then place, or you get some two stroke oil, lubricate this with two stroke oil. You would then place your three millimeter internal diameter and five millimeter external diameter small fuel line inside the five millimeter internal diameter in colored fluoro yellow 